was how do you know an area is a good area to invest um, in apartments or single family homes? And this is a really good question. And I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on it because uh, I can't tell you how many people um, come to me and show me an apartment complex or even um, have some numbers on it and, and ask me if it's a good investment. And I generally say the same thing every time, unless I know the market pretty well, uh, I have no idea. You know, what did your market analysis tell you about the area? Because before you jump into any asset, you really have to understand the MSA. And the MSA is the Metropolitan Statistical Area. It's a, a, a name that the government gives generally areas that are 100,000 uh, population or greater, I believe. Um, you need to understand what it's doing <clears throat> and more specifically what the submarket's doing. Um, then once you've identified good MSAs and submarkets, then you can look for real estate in those areas. Um, so really the question is, how do you know what good MSAs and submarkets are? Um, and that I can, I can help with. Uh, but if you just give me an apartment and say, is this a good deal? I, I don't know. I don't know anything about it. I don't know anything about the area. Um, so there's several ways to evaluate a good MSA and submarkets. But, but kind of a, a 30,000 foot view um, is just for purposes of, of this conversation and, and for time. I look at several things. The first thing I'm gonna look at is population. Um, I generally want a metro area that's going to be greater than 500,000 folks. And this is just a general rule now. Um, if it's your backyard, like, you know, we ended up having, I think 400 plus units in Lexington, Kentucky, and it has 200, it had 250,000 people but we had very uh, strong operational expertise there. So it made sense for us. That, that's one thing, but looking over the, the country and looking for different places to invest as a, as a rule, I would say, you know, $500,000 or excuse me, 500,000 people population will ensure that there's going to be ample supply of assets and which means there's going to be ample supply of um, people to fill those assets, renters. And um, also there's going to be, a sufficient amount of property management that are worth their salt. Um, because you, I think I've said this many times that you know property management is gonna be 70, 80% of your success. So you wanna make sure that there's good property management in these areas. Um, and, and a lot of other things that I'll be talking about as well, like uh, population growth. You know, we talked about the population, but what is the growth doing? Um, I prefer stably increasing. And you're gonna hear that from me a lot um, because Newsflash, folks, real estate's boring. It, it's not difficult. Um, it, it, it's just a process that you need to go through. Um, a lot of people are stock traders, uh, option traders, and those types of things. And that's the first thing they tell you. When you deviate from your process, that's when you get smacked. So real estate's just about developing your process and sticking to it. Um, and, and you'll be wildly successful with it. <clears throat> but um, like I said, I prefer them stably increasing. Now, if it's a stably increasing and all of a sudden they hit a high growth, that, that's totally fine. Uh, but I want to look a little bit further upstream and to make sure that they're not just a, a meteoric rise uh, because I don't want to get exposed to that volatility. I don't want to get exposed, um, you know, speeding in a boom bust market. You know, some people are saying like uh, Boise is right now. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with that, but that's, that's kind of what a lot of people are talking about. Um, Overall, you know, the average annual growth must be positive on a five-year trend and a 10-year trend. Um, that's kind of what I look at. I want to see five and 10-year trends. Um, then I look at employment growth as well. Once again, stably increasing. I want to see it over five to 10 years. I want to see it equal or greater than the U.S. average. Um, I don't need it to be gangbusters. Um, there, there are several markets that are, but once again, I'm just, we're looking at stably increasing over, over time. Um, I, I generally want the, the proven versus the up and comer, if you will. Um, and the next thing I'll be looking at is, is income growth. Um, same, same mantra, stably increasing over the past five to 10 years. But, but more importantly, I compare employment growth with income growth. And this is kind of nuanced, but if you have a ton of low paying jobs moving into the area, your employment growth is going to be higher but your income growth will not. Um, so I want income growth higher than employment growth, but I want them both increasing nicely, if that makes sense. 
Um, you know, you don't want a bunch of low paying jobs moving into your tenant base when you're trying to move people into A and B class apartments or, you know, a nice single family home, something like that. Um, and the next thing I look at is the population changing. Um, do we have a positive net migration? Are our people leaving the city? Um, are we attracting people from around the U.S.? Because that's, that's very positive. Like, you know, Indianapolis and Charlotte come to mind as two good cities that are really attracting, um, you know, good talent into the city. And so the housing prices are going up and the um, vacancies are going down and all the things you like to see when you're in real estate. Um, the other thing would be employment distribution. Um, th this is big. I like to see at least kind of three sectors represented in the MSAs that I'm going to be investing in. You know, I, I prefer um, really um, major employment hubs, if you will, uh, that are kind of evergreen employers that can maybe last through a pandemic or something like that. Um, so like uh, government seats, you know, state government seats are preferred to county or regional, um, but you know, a state government seat, even though they shut down the government during the pandemic, they still employed people and kept paying people and people still stayed in their apartments. Um, education is another big, one of the big three. Uh, large established universities, um, you know, a lot of them went to online, uh, that's fine, but they didn't fire a bunch of their faculty and stuff like that. Everybody stayed employed. Um, healthcare is huge, um, you know, including large research hospitals, educational hospitals, these big medical corridors, like the Raleigh-Durham area. Um, you know, I just, I just want to make sure that there's good employers there. Um, and I also want to make sure that they're not tied solely to one or two sectors, especially if those sectors are like highly integrated. And, and what I mean by that is like, say you have a manufacturing plant and then you have, you know, three other major employers that basically service that manufacturing plant with widgets. Um, and that manufacturing plant goes out of business and then everybody goes out of business. So that, that's, that's kind of a, a red flag to me. You know, these cities that have, you know, one, two major sources of employment that all the other ones kind of build around. Um, and, you know, I, I used to think this a little more so than I do now, but, but long-term existence of uh, military bases, um, you know, there was a lot of movement of military bases in the late 90s and the early 2000s, and it seemed to have stabilized a little bit, but, you know, if, if military bases are the main source of your housing, I probably would look elsewhere. Um, the next thing I would look at is state and local governments. Are they landlord and business friendly? Um, know the tenant landlord laws, know the property taxes, um, know the, the business taxes and incentives. Are they trying to bring new talent and new businesses in? Um, but the landlord laws for the state, it's going to directly impact your ability to I mean, something as little as collect late fees to something as, um, you know, important as being able to do timely evictions. So you need to know what the landlord laws are. And I mentioned before the general property taxes and business taxes, because, you know, you want them to be competitive. You want them to be drawing people in versus kicking people out. I mean, I think, I think some of the best examples are New York and California. You know, there's a huge exodus of, of New York and California because, you know, most um, business friendly states um, are attracting those people um, like Virginia, the Carolinas, uh, Georgia, Florida, Texas, Indiana, you know, uh, Missouri. A lot of those are becoming much more business friendly um, and kind of a, like a little ninja trick that I tell people is look how much the cities owe in debt um, and look and see if their budgets or the, yeah, if their budget is balanced because if they need money, they're going to come after businesses and raise property taxes first. That's what they'll do. So you need to know those types of things um, to see if um, it, it will be a good fit for where you're looking to invest. Um, <clears throat> not so important, but I know there's a lot of people that live on the coast and, and they love it. Um, but I generally don't invest in places with known environmental or um, uh, frequent environmental hazards, if you will, like hurricanes and, and, and those types of things. So, you know, think of cities along the coast um, because it, I don't have anything against them. I mean, I'm on one right now. I'm sitting here at a beach, but um, the, the main thing is, you know, you're going to have to pay a lot in hazard insurance and flood insurance due to frequent storms and hurricanes, those types of things. So 
those are, you know, to, to keep in the back of your mind. I'm not saying they're um, the end all be all, but it's, this is kind of the, the lesser, I guess, of the criteria. Um, but you, you have to realize that, you know, anything that may drive people out, like at, to have a large exodus could really, really adversely affect you having multifamily in that area or single family. I mean, think of Katrina in New Orleans, think of, um, you know, Flint, Michigan, when they uh, basically had the, or still have the lead in the pipes issues and stuff like that. Um, the other thing I look at is unemployment. Um, just one it lower than the national and regional averages. Um, mainly the regional average, I want it like lower than the national and then lower than the regional. Because that tells me that I'm, I'm a honing in on a very good employment center. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the preference is to, to have a, a stable rate that's been, you know, consistently outperforming the national average for the past five or 10 years. Um, that's, that's usually my metric is five to 10 years. Um, let's see, the rental, yeah, rent, rental vacancy is, is what I would want to know about as well. Um, I want it lower than the national and regional averages again. You know, it must be, um, you know, at or beating those averages for me to be interested in the area. And one other thing that a lot of people don't look at, uh, it's kind of a nuanced thing, but, but is homeowner vacancy. And it's not as important as rental vacancy, but it's important because if there's larger than normal homeowner vacancy in conjunction with good affordability in the area, well, then that's a precursor to people moving out of apartments and moving into homes. Um, so, and, and you're trying to basically put people into apartments. So those two don't mix for you. <laughs> um, so that, that's one thing you want to make sure. I mean, and generally, you know, a good percentage that I go by, I don't want my homeowner vacancy more than 10%. And I have some websites that I can pop in the chat a little bit later, um, just to kind of, so you all can go through and, and do some of this yourself and look at different, um, look at some of these different um, parameters that I've been talking about. And there's more, uh, but for the sake of time, I, I just kind of want to move on a bit. Um, I talk a little bit about the submarket. And so you're looking at MSA first, right? And then you look at your submarket. And your submarket is basically your, I call it the one, three, five analysis, one mile, three mile, five mile analysis. Um, you you want to think of things like th this is much more granular. Um, you're still looking at jobs, you're still looking at median income and those types of things. But here's where you look at schools. Um, this is important if the unit mixes that you are um, interested in are two bedroom or three bedroom, because you're going to have families living in there and they're going to want to know what the schools are like. And if the schools are bad, then you will not have good renters. Um, the next thing I look at is crime. Um, any violent crime, murder, rape, armed robbery, all bad. Um, those, are, those are just hard stops for me um, if, if it has a bad violent crime uh, rate. However, if the violent crime is okay, but it has a really high property rate, uh, excuse me, property crime rate, um, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, well, I don't, I don't like any type of crime. Well, just, just pull back and look and see what's around it. You know, if you have a mall or a shopping center, a major shopping center within three miles of your apartment complex, well, you know, guess where car break-ins happen the most? They happen in big parking lots, uh, in malls and, and shopping centers and those types of things. So that, necess that isn't necessarily a bad thing at all. Uh, that's not going to affect your apartment complex uh, hardly at all. So dig in a little to those, um, those metrics to make sure that you're not over, you know, overlooking a, a really good apartment complex because you think that the crime's too bad. Uh, and then I look at income per capita, uh, and household income. You know, the income per capita used to be the 40 to 70 range, and that, that's creeped up to 50 to 90,000. You want your, your average apartment renter, you know, is making 50 to $90,000 in the A and B class. So that's one thing that, you know, you need to, to look at. And like I said, these websites I give you, you'll be able to look up that stuff. Um, the, the surrounding area, you know, the retail, the grocery, the walkability score. Um, you know, if you're, if you're looking at and you see family dollars and pawn shops and low level fast food, you know, you're probably not in a B and A neighborhood, uh, a class B or class A neighborhood. So, I mean, you can just use Google Earth and Google Maps for a lot of this. Um, 
and that's really all I'll say about location um, for investing at this point, but it's super, super important. Um, your location is, is the biggest thing that you cannot change about your investment. Um, so choose very, very wisely there.